Second time, thank you all very much for uh, coming uh, to this Global Strategy Forum event where we're going to be addressed by Lord Sedwell, Mark Sedwell, one of the most uh, distinguished diplomats and public servants of his generation. Mark um, is now a member of the House of Lords. He's non-executive director of Rothschilds and Lloyds and does plenty of other uh, not-for-profit uh, things. Uh, he was originally in the, in the Foreign Service and uh, he, he served in Egypt. He's a member of the Camel uh, Corps, so an Arabist, so he served in uh, Egypt, Syria, Jordan, and Cyprus, and uh, Pakistan, uh, and was British ambassador and NATO's representative in Afghanistan from 2009 and to 2011. He then made a very interesting translation uh, into the Home Civil Service, uh, where I think it was, you, you run the visas uh, of operation, and then decided, because he, he likes easy jobs, that he'd become a permanent secretary uh, at the Home Office, um, uh, which is one of the most, I mean, I, I can tell you, it's one of the most difficult uh, departments to run. And not because the people aren't any good in there, let me tell you, it, the, it, the reason for that, which sometimes critics and home secretaries miss, is because of the clients the Home Office has, who, uh, it, it, I, in education or health, the clients, school children, patients, have a similar interest to those actually delivering the service. In the Home Office, it's exactly the opposite. Uh, so illegal immigrants uh, want to evade detection. Uh, prisoners would like to escape. Uh, criminals uh, would like uh, to uh, carry on being criminals, and so on. Um, so that's, anyway, he did it brilliantly there, and then became a national security advisor for two years. Uh, and uh, he was also, as we know, cabinet secretary and head of the civil service for two years. An absolutely stellar career. The thing that's not mentioned on this official biography uh, is, for me, the most important, is that when I went to the Foreign Office uh, in June 2001, um, blinking out of shock uh, that uh, Mr Blair had asked me to do this job, uh, I was met... Uh, by Mark, who'd already served a year for uh, Robin Cook, and he was abs Mark was terrific. Uh, he he says that he he worked for me. Well, I think you know. I think that uh, some. I mean, I, he never never suggested that I was working for, for him, uh, but it was very much a, a mutual relationship. Um, a couple of uh, housekeeping uh, matters. This is being broadcast online. It's also being recorded, so it's an open public event, is not, not under uh, Chatham House rules. The, the second thing is for those who are, I think a, a large number of people who are watching this online, I'm sorry we can't take, um, as it were, oral questions from you, but if you want to, if you're on, online, you want to ask a question, please use the Q&A function on the Zoom. Uh, and the wonderful Jacqueline Jinks, who you can't see, uh, but who, uh, who, who runs Global Strategy Forum, uh, will be uh, as, as the, uh, the gerund is curating uh, uh, these questions so that uh, Mark uh, can answer them. Um, we're going to finish bang on too uh, because that's uh, how, we, how we run things. Mark's going to speak uh, for as long as he wishes uh, to begin with. Uh, I may then ask uh, a few questions and then it's open to you and colleagues who are watching. Mark, you are very welcome and thank you very, very much. Uh, for being willing to do this event. Well, Jack, thank you. Um, great privilege uh, to be here. Uh, I know the kind of speakers you've had before, so uh, it's an honor to join their list. And uh, I thought I'd try and be fairly brief at the beginning because we have some very distinguished colleagues in the audience, and I hope they won't just ask questions, but actually uh, we'll hear some of their uh, points of view, uh, uh, points of view as well. Um, I haven't spoken much publicly about uh, Russia's invasion of, U uh, of Ukraine. In fact, the only uh, public intervention I've really made was in my maiden speech in the House of Lords a few weeks ago, where several uh, uh, colleagues and ex-bosses uh, were uh, were present. Uh, and I'll try and be as pithy as one is required to be uh, in the uh, in the House of Lords. I'm grateful to David and Jock, who were sitting either side of me and giving me a bit of moral support as I. Uh, as I spoke uh, in, that, uh, in that debate. And Jack, very kind of you to, 
uh, hostess. Um, I think I learned more, uh, having, having essentially spent the first part of my career entirely overseas and entirely in places um, where uh, democracy wasn't really running quite as smoothly as, uh, as it uh, did here, if at all. I learned more about how to run uh, foreign policy and address national security issues in the domestic, in the context of uh, domestic politics from, from you who always had, were always grounded in that uh, and reminded us that so many foreign policy issues are also domestic policy issues and that was a lesson that stood me in very good stead. So thank you. It's great to be on the platform with you. I just wanted to touch on three topics just to introduce um, the conversation day. First, just to talk briefly about the situation on the ground in Ukraine and, and where we are. Um, uh, now uh, and the risks of escalation. Second, with the NATO summit uh, coming up in two days' time, perhaps just to give some thoughts about the things I hope the leaders uh, will uh, address at that summit. And then third, almost just a sort of taster of some of the issues that a forum like this I think should be thinking about, which is the so what in the long term. What, what impact is this uh, this crisis following, after, following the COVID crisis likely to have on some of the big global trends um, in the long term. There's a good piece the other day in, uh, 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 in one of the newspapers which reminded us that crises are all-encompassing when they happen, but often in the long term have less impact than you might expect at the time. And I thought uh, it's too early to say with this one, but it's perhaps just worth starting to think about some of those uh, questions as well. So first, the situation. Well, um, I genuinely don't know, um, I'm not sure anyone does, uh, in, even in Western intelligence services, whether Putin told President uh, Xi Jinping when they met at the Olympics uh, that he was planning to invade Ukraine. But if he did, then I'm, I am absolutely sure he would have assured President Xi that it would be quick and decisive. And clearly it hasn't been, uh, and the Russian plan is seriously off track. Now, when you have a military campaign that is off track like that, there are only really three things you can do. Uh, you can reinforce, uh, and there are much more distinguished military uh, colleagues in the audience, so you can tell me whether you agree or disagree. But you reinforce, you can change tactics, or you can reduce your war aims. And essentially, we've seen some signs that they're doing all three. Uh, the aims that they're now setting out, essentially neutralizing Ukraine, um, consolidating their grip on the territories they'd already taken, particularly in Crimea and the Donbass, uh, uh, etc., were aims they probably could have achieved, he could probably have achieved without invasion. And it's worth just reminding ourselves of what he said as the invasion uh, went ahead, um, essentially uh, determining to incorporate Ukraine into some kind of greater Russia, at least with the same status as Belarus. So he's had to at least signal a reduction in war aims, whether that is a bluff or whether it's genuine, we don't know. In terms of the change of tactics, well, a quick and decisive race for the capital, securing territory, has clearly run into the sand, and it's run into the sand because of the courage, but also the effectiveness of Ukrainian uh, resistance. And therefore, he switched, uh, the Russians have switched to tactics we've seen in Syria and saw in Chechnya before, of essentially brutal attacks on the civilian population to try and break the will of the resistance. And the reinforcements that we're seeing, that third tactic, um, are partly designed, in my judgment, to support that. So talk of the Chechens, of irregulars coming in from Syria, they are more likely to be willing to inflict uh, 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 casualties, civilian casualties, as they move into civilian areas, into the cities, than Russian conscripts, who, of course, will find themselves dealing with civilians who look very like uh, and sound very like uh, their own uh, their own people. And so I think uh, uh, the shift in tactics is clearly towards a more brutal approach. And one of the major risks of escalation arises from the potential use, as we saw from his allies in Syria, of chemical weapons and, God forbid, potentially even nuclear, although that threat seems to have receded, uh, uh, receded somewhat. At the beginning of this campaign, uh, the threat of escalation appeared to come from the potential success of the Russian invasion. People were worried that if he did succeed, if this quick and decisive campaign did succeed, would they keep going? Were the Baltics at threat? Uh, would they move through the Suwalki Gap? What about Moldova? What about uh, NATO territory itself? Well, clearly that threat has receded, again, thanks to um, uh, brave and effective Ukrainian uh, resistance. But the risks of escalation as this, as this conflict uh, becomes bogged down um, are still there. Uh, the use of chemical weapons, um, uh, Russian potential attacks on uh, supply lines of equipment to the Ukrainian resistance, however that is configured, could, could 
uh, provoke incidents that could cause an escalation between uh, Russia and uh, Russia and NATO. And so uh, we mustn't assume that this conflict will stay contained within Ukraine, although obviously uh, in terms of global security, it is better that it does um, uh, 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 and let's hope for a successful resolution. In terms of what NATO uh, should do this week in that context, um, uh, and there will be views on the uh, success or otherwise, the wisdom or otherwise of NATO tactics so far, but I think there are five things I would hope uh, I would hope to see. The first is that NATO should double down on what we've seen so far, which is essentially an updated version of the Reagan Doctrine, uh, supplying really significant capability to maintain um, the fighting capability of the Ukrainian resistance. And that's what Reagan did in, we have a former Afghan uh, National Security Advisor and Foreign Minister here, Dr. Zalmay Rasul. That's essentially what Reagan did in uh, Afghanistan uh, in the 80s. And, we, and that's what we've done in Ukraine, and we should double down uh, on that. Um, second, I think NATO should uh, deploy more troops up to the eastern uh, borders. We currently have uh, troops deployed called the Enhanced Forward Presence, but those are essentially a tripwire. They aren't uh, a capability that could really slow down a serious, um, uh, a serious attack uh, by the Russians, but they're designed to be a tripwire to reassure our eastern allies that British and German and other troops would be engaged and therefore we would be engaged if there were an incursion by Russia into their territory. We need to move from deterrence, which is essentially what that's part of, to theatre defence and push more uh, capability, all arms capability forward, and by the way, that should include uh, the new domains as well of cyber and space and, and uh, information uh, uh, campaigns as well, and we've seen some good signs of that. Um, uh, third, um, uh, NATO needs, the other NATO nations need to demonstrate to the East Europeans a very generous and open approach to the refugee crisis. Now, you might think that isn't a security issue, but if you're an East European wondering about Article 5 and just how solid Article 5 is, then an important proxy for that in the short term is, is a demonstration that we will share the burden with them of the refugee crisis. So as well as being the right thing to do on humanitarian grounds, it's the right thing to do in terms of uh, security and the integrity of the Article 5 commitment uh, as well. Um, fourth, and this is the one which may prove controversial uh, with some of you, um, uh, whether it was wise or not to signal in advance that there would be no military intervention in, uh, uh, within Ukraine itself as a non-NATO non, non -NATO member and that the uh, response to a Russian invasion would be sanctions and not military involvement. And there are views, you know, different views, of course, about whether that was wise. Um, uh, NATO does need to... Uh, 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 determine what our response would be were chemical, let alone theatre nuclear weapons used in Ukraine. Now, I'm at the hawkish end on this. I think whatever the territorial issues, the use of weapons of mass destruction does cross a threshold. Um, it seems to me that we do at least need to keep on the table the option of, uh, uh, of military intervention should that happen. We had flexible response in the 80s in, uh, 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 at the end of the Cold War. Um, to, um, uh, uh, to, to essentially ensure that there would be a proportionate response to escalatory action by the Soviet Union at that time. I think we need to revive some of those concepts. But others will take a different view. I recognise that. I think the key point is that the NATO leadership have worked out what their position is on that, how explicitly they're going to signal it to the Russians in order that uh, we deter, as best we can, the use of weapons of mass destruction within uh, Ukraine, even tactical ones. And then fifth, um, NATO needs to make real and show that there is a program to make real uh, the various welcome commitments to increase defence expenditure, uh, etc., notably Germany, uh, meeting the target that was set back in, 19, in 2014 um, uh, at the uh, summit uh, uh, at Celtic Manor to hit the 2% by 2024, but with a range of other uh, capability commitments, investment in equipment, the readiness initiative, etc. Uh, we need to see a programme, not just a series of headline commitments, that means that within the next year or two, NATO's capability, real capability, is significantly enhanced and demonstrably so, and that means integrated capability. There will be various military officers here who know that the, fragment, the fragmentation of NATO capability is one of its constraints. Proper integrated capability, proper resolution of the various squabbles between NATO and the EU over headquarters, etc., in order to 
uh, enhance the long-term capability of NATO in the, uh, in the continent. And I think the summit in a couple of days' time could make commitments on all five of those things. I don't know whether they will, but I'd like to see that. Final thing then, what about the, the so what for the future? Well, uh, if we were having this uh, kind of session three or even six months ago, we'd probably be talking about globalization, the tech revolution, um, uh, uh, aging populations worldwide, um, the response to climate change, and the US-China um, uh, uh, rivalry, strategic competition, as the big determining factors of the world economy, global security, etc., over the next 25 years. And we wouldn't have been wrong to do so, and it's worth just reminding ourselves those will remain the really big uh, determinants of the course of the economy, security, and the environment over the next 25 years. So how have those been affected by COVID and Ukraine? And very briefly, it seems to me that uh, the retreat from globalization has probably been uh, uh, reinforced. And the question is how far that retreat will go. Um, the G7 report that I was one of the authors of suggested uh, most markets could remain global, but there would have to be um, a, a series of areas which, where essentially the glo globalization should be re uh, replaced by an allied um, set of markets where we have reliable supply among allies, and of course some, on, some at the national level as well. Um, uh, it would be a pity to, uh, uh, to lose the benefits of globalization by going straight to sort of national protectionism. There are some options in between, but the retreat from globalization will clearly um, uh, move further, and that will affect the technological revolution as well. There are a series of big monopolies in the tech revolution that are underpinning the tech revolution that are going to have to be tackled. We're over-dependent on critical minerals from China, over-dependent on semiconductors from Taiwan and South Korea, both allies and partners, but clearly in highly vulnerable uh, geographic, uh, geographic uh, region. Uh, and the big digital and data monopolies are something many governments are, uh, are, are wrestling with, and I think both these campaigns will have reminded us of some of our vulnerabilities there. Uh, demographics, etc., probably not a big change. Climate change, probably not a big change, although energy security, of course, has come back up the agenda, and we re we re we we're re being reminded um, uh, as food security is uh, coming under pressure as a result of the Ukraine crisis, uh, that there are other environmental issues, biodiversity, AMR, and so on, that could affect our food security, and so those are also issues that need to be uh, on the agenda. And then the US-China uh, rivalry, I think that is really interesting. And the Chinese position is one of the um, uh, most intriguing in this whole, uh, in this whole crisis. Uh, it was clear that um, both governments wanted, having set out a position of you know, almost uh, Cold War 2.0 rivalry, wanted to stabilize that rivalry in the very short term. That's partly because they both have big political events coming up this autumn and don't want trouble the midterms for President Biden and the 20th Party Congress for President Xi, where he's seeking to consolidate power and get this unprecedented uh, third term. But clearly, in the long run, um, they are set to be um, uh, major, uh, major rivals. And how we react to Ukraine uh, and how resolute the West can be and whether we can demonstrate the real strategic patience that we haven't always demonstrated with some of the conflicts of the past 20 years will, in my judgment, determine much of the progress of that US-China rivalry and the peace and security, in particular, of the Pacific region, but probably uh, of the globe as a whole. So the, the COVID and Ukraine crisis do matter. Um, uh, I think uh, what, is, what, what, what I'm struck by is that, it, is that uh, it's still open as to how they matter and what impact they will have on some of those big global trends uh, that, as I say, will determine security uh, uh, world, the world economy, global security, and the environment over the next 25 years. Jack, that's probably enough by way of introduction. Thank you very much. Uh, it, it's not enough, Mark, but I give him the, the fact that uh, the, the clock is ticking. Um, thank, thank you very much for that. Um, I'm going to have, uh, use my privilege as a chair just to ask you one question and then ask, invite questions from here. And then, with a bit of luck, we'll be receiving questions on the Q&A function, please, or if you're uh, watching this uh, remotely, um, uh, and we'll, uh, we'll call up as many of those questions as we can. The question I had for you, Mark, was how resolute do you think Germany and France uh, are going to be? Um, so far, they've been very good, uh, and Germany has absolutely remarkably uh, 
uh, turned 180 degrees. Uh, and Schultz, in a space, space of one speech, uh, changed uh, Germany's foreign and defence policy um, of, of the past 30 years. But heavily, Germany is heavily reliant still on oil and gas from Russia. Germany is amazingly invested in China, with one in two Volkswagen cars sold in the world, sold to China and made in China. So do you think that uh, if the pressure really ramps up f for different related re reasons that Germany and France will stay resolute behind the US, UK and, and the, the, the Eastern Europeans? I think as long, uh, it's a great question. I think, I think we should look at it in two parts. I think within Europe, as long as it's seen as actually staying resolute behind the East Europeans and Ukraine, rather than being in a supporting role to the US with the UK alongside, then you know, that, that would make a difference. And I think as well, sometimes um, it, it, it has in any relationship, if you get an unpleasant shock because you think you know, that the relationship was going smoothly and suddenly it turns out not to be, then the strength of disillusion can actually force you into a more uh, in, into a tougher position. And so I think that's what we've seen with the Germans, actually, in, in, in relation to Russia. So not only this welcome switch, as you say, in their defence policy, uh, uh, especially after a long period um, uh, uh, of uh, essentially consensus in Germany, they weren't going to even try to hit the 2%, let alone do everything else they might, uh, they might need to. But actually also uh, recognising that they have become over-dependent on Russian gas, etc., and that they need, to, they need to diversify away and improve their, they improve their energy security. And it seems to me that those decisions, although there will be tactical um, movements along, uh, along the way, those decisions are now settled, and, and, it's, and I think there is a new consensus within Germany that those are the right way to go. I think it would be a pretty brave politician in Germany who said, let's say somehow or other there's a very fragile peace settlement negotiated in Ukraine, and, and I certainly wouldn't bet any of my own money on that happening, let alone lasting. But even then, I don't think many politicians in Germany would say, that's OK, we can go back to depending on Russia for, you know, for, for gas um, uh, and um, uh, allowing our defences to, uh, uh, de to wither. And of course, you know, with France, France has always maintained a very strong defence posture and was already very close to the 2%, arguably, depending on how you count it, uh, uh, over it, and strong, of course, on nuclear doctrine uh, uh, and so on. I think China is a different question. I think China, uh, and, but I think China is a different question for, for all of us. The UK hasn't had the same position as essentially where the center of gravity is in Washington uh, on China and continued, has continued to believe, and I continue to believe, it is right to have a mixture of engagement with China whilst also being very firm about behavior where we will draw a line and stand up uh, for our interests with others. Um, uh, China is a very different prospect uh, to Russia. And I think we mustn't assume that every authoritarian state, let alone behave, and you know this, you know, great expert on Iran and others, um, if we behave as though every authoritarian state is, is going to destabilize the global security architecture, then they will. And what we have to try and recognize is some will and some won't. And those that are willing to be, you know, who may be authoritarian and autocratic domestically, but are willing to be part of a, essentially a stable global security architecture, a stable global rule of law externally, while we're never going to be allies with them in the same way we would with other democracies, then we have to engage them and try and bring them into an aligned position. And I just think with China, it's clearly the rising superpower. I don't think we should assume it's necessarily heading in the same direction as, uh, as Putin's Russia. Thank you very much. Oops. Uh, Jock Stallard, yeah. 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 Uh, Sir, uh, so, forum uh, uh, board member. Um, a comment and, and, and a question straight challenge, if I may. First of all, the, the, the comment is on potential use of weapons of mass destruction in uh, Ukraine. Um, uh, frankly, I would see this not as a NATO issue, but as a global security issue, and that I think should be should condition the response. It isn't just about NATO. I mean, this is big for the entire world. Um, but can I challenge you on some of the things you said about China? One of the lessons that it seems to me has emerged from this conflict, not a new lesson, alas, 
is that autocracies are very, very dangerous things, uh, particularly when they're associated with military power, and most particularly when they're associated with nuclear weapons. I mean, autocracies, of course, can turn on a sixpence, uh, and the policy of, uh, of engaging but tut-tutting when we didn't agree is basically what we followed with Russia, and you know that's worked really well. Um, so uh, what my question <coughs> is, um, how far has China traveled down the road towards autocracy, uh, and uh, how ought that to condition our policy responses in the future? Because while I understand what you say about you know, needing to try and engage, um, if you are dealing with an autocracy, surely you need to be prepared for them, for them to turn on a sixpence um, and pose really serious threats to you uh, and your interests. Thanks. Um, uh, thanks, John. I mean, um, so I, don't, I, I, I agree with you on both points, actually, and it may just be that we're expressing it uh, uh, slightly differently. I think on the first point, you're absolutely right. It isn't just uh, the, the use of weapons of mass destruction in Ukraine isn't just a NATO issue, but I sort of focus my remarks around the NATO summit um, in a couple of days' time. Um, and I think, I think NATO should be at the core of a global response to that, even if it isn't limited to NATO. Uh, and certainly without NATO, there is no effective position on that. Um, I think second on China, um, uh, uh, there's, there's probably a, def a, a dictionary definition we don't have time to get into about the difference between an authoritarian regime and an, and an autocracy. And I think there is a difference, uh, and there is a difference there. I mean, autocracies tend to be very personal around one individual. And China is clearly, there are clearly some risk signs of that in China with President Xi Jinping wanting to, um, uh, it would appear, extend his term in office rather than sticking with the previous uh, convention of uh, doing two terms and then handing on to another generation. And I think that's one of the things we should um, uh, have concern about in China. The Chinese system, um, although authoritarian within the Communist Party, was actually quite a deeply embedded system and wasn't really the rule by one man. And, and for very good reasons, they'd moved away from that. Um, if they head back in that direction, then the risks of turning on a sixpence, the risks of um, volatile behaviour clearly increase. I think your answer is also the correct one, that um, being able to trade, being able to engage, being able to find things on which you need to work together, we have to work with China on climate change, etc., does not mean that you, you should just tut-tut or be weak on other things. So I think we should take a very firm position on the areas that we disagree with them. We should... I'm still in favour of the Indo-Pacific tilt. I think that is part of what the UK as a global uh, operator, a member of the Security Council, should do. It doesn't mean neglecting Europe, but it does mean we should be present in the Pacific with our allies. Um, and we should be prepared to stand up, uh, including in military terms, for uh, our principles there uh, as well. And authoritarian states, as you know as well as I, respect one thing above all, and that is strength. And so if we show strength, we hopefully can avoid getting into the kind of conflict that we found ourselves uh, experiencing in Ukraine. Uh, James. <coughs> yeah, uh, thank you, Mark. A riveting talk, and great to be doing these events in person at last, but um, beastly to be doing it against the background of these horrors unfolding. Um, my question, I'm James Kidner from Rebellion Defense. We do artificial intelligence for defense and security. Um, my question builds on the one that Jack Straw just asked about France and Germany. And it's really about the attention span of democracies and when you think that fatigue is going to set in. Because we saw with, uh, with Syria and then again with Afghanistan that the eyes of the public go off the ball. And what can the leaders of these, of these democracies do to keep that eye on the ball and to keep the pressure up? Because if Ukraine drags on into some kind of a stalemate, it's going to be very difficult to sustain current levels of engagement. James, thank you. I mean, I, I agree with you. Again, uh, and I think, uh, uh, and of course it was you know, tragically the eye was taken off the ball in the case of Afghanistan, with which I feel, as, as colleagues know, a very personal connection. And, and I was deeply dismayed by the events of last August, as many others in this room and elsewhere were. Uh, and, and it was not inevitable, by the way. It was not inevitable. But that's probably a conversation for another day. Look, I think this comes down in the end to political leadership. If you polled in the 1980s, unilateral nuclear disarmament was more popular than retaining the nuclear deterrent. The deployment of Pershing missiles into uh, Western Europe was vehemently opposed by many, many uh, uh, people. Um, uh, Ronald Reagan was deeply unpopular in this country when he became 
uh, president. And yet, throughout that period, the, the electorate also knew, whilst sort of preferring when asked the question unilateral nuclear disarmament, they weren't going to vote for anyone who was actually going to do anything about it. And there was a sense in which um, uh, you, you couldn't be, and you'll remember this, Jack, from you know, your early years in Parliament, you, you, couldn't, you, weren't, you wouldn't be treated as a responsible government, potential government, unless you maintained the nuclear deterrent in this country, um, even if it was an unpopular thing to do. People wanted their politicians, their leaders, to be willing to shoulder choices that were at least apparently unpopular in order uh, to reassure them they really had their, their interests at heart. And the public do sometimes do that. You see that in opinion polling. So I think the same is true now. The political leadership, the political class, parliament, there are parliamentarians, you know, some of us for the first time in this room, have to show leadership on this and have to ensure that we don't lose patience um, the way we have on some of the post 9-11 um, uh, issues uh, of the past 20 years. Uh, thank you, Mark. And I, I can confirm I do indeed remember the early 80s and trying to fight uh, the uh, 1983 election uh, on uh, um, uh, withdrawing from the EU um, an, an alternative economic strategy, which was essentially printing money uh, and abandoning our nuclear weapons. And I, the only reason I survived was because I made up my own policies. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, Pro Professor Michael Clark uh, has a question. Uh, online uh, mark for you, which is, what is your current betting on Finland and or Sweden applying for NATO membership quite soon as a result of this crisis? I think, I think for Michael Clark, of all people, to be asking me that question, it's a question I might, I might feel like asking him, since he's a much greater expert on this uh, than I am. Uh, I think the short answer is it depends on the crisis. Um, uh, there was a lot of speculation about that in the early days, particularly when it looked as though the Russian um, uh, uh, invasion was going to move swiftly to a decisive and successful conclusion, and then the fear that he would keep going somehow through the Suwalki Gap or um, threatening the Baltics, etc. And perhaps that has receded uh, a little. But of course, I think it would be um, good for both those countries and good for NATO were they to join. Um, uh, but I think it's better that that kind of decision is not taken in the heat of a, the heat of the moment. Those are major strategic choices for uh, Sweden and Finland, particularly for Finland given its history, and therefore I would hope that they wouldn't um, 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 uh, you, you wouldn't see political leaders there immediately jumping one way or the other on this, but actually there being a real um, uh, considered conversation, political conversation in those countries. Um, about NATO membership, and then I hope the outcome of that conversation would be through whatever process they have that they should join. Thank you very much. I'm going to, uh, because time continues to run on, I'm going to uh, take questions two at a time. So if I may, take Alan West and David Hannay, please, and we'll wait for somebody else to pop up online. Alan. Uh, Admiral West, say that. Um, <laughs> sense, uh, we all know that, Alan. I think. Uh, we should hang our heads in shame in, in the West. Uh, we have known now for more than 10 years that Putin is an enemy, and a number of us have actually said that. If one looks at his actions, you know, with the Polonium uh, and the, then we looked at what he did in terms of invading Georgia, uh, uh, right on through to the Crimea, and a whole raft of things, you know, using, using uh, nerve agents in Salisbury. So we've known that. We've also known that we are likely to have state-on-state -state war again. And yet, no governments, succeeding governments, have not invested in resilience. In, and by resilience, I'm covering the whole gamut there of, of you know, energy security, making sure you have firms that can produce sovereign capability, et cetera, et cetera, communications links, all these things, or the armed forces. And at the moment, we have armed forces. We have, we mentioned troops in, in the Baltic states. Uh, someone referred to them, I think very accurately, that group of a couple of thousand troops, as a tethered goat. That's what it is if we're thinking about fighting a conventional war against Russian forces. Because we have not structured our forces, we have not put the money into them necessary for that, so we've, we've hidden from that. I understand that uh, tomorrow Rishi Sunak is not going to give any extra money for defence. Could I ask your thoughts on, do you think this has been a clever way to behave, and do you think that that's part of the reason when Putin looks at the West, that countries like us, and even worse in Europe, he thinks they have not got the stomach for a fight and they won't do it. Thank you. David. Hello. Um, Mark, you spoke um, 
about moving away from globalization <coughs> as if it, was, it could be a controlled process over which uh, we, um, one of the great beneficiaries of globalization, would be able to keep it under control. And you said, uh, but we must avoid protectionism. But of course, the only time that the world moved really decisively away from globalization was in the 1930s, and it proved impossible to stop, and in fact became one of the drivers of the instability and the horrors that then came about. And don't you also think, I mean, if you agree with that, don't you think also it's worth looking at the relative interest in globalization of China and Russia, which tells you that whereas China lives and dies by globalization and cannot possibly support a world that has closed in on itself and is protectionist uh, without great damage, uh, Putin probably deludes himself into thinking he can get along fine without anyone else. Uh, so we would be, if we move away from globalization, particularly if it's a, an uncontrolled process, be giving up one of the wedge issues <coughs> which could come between uh, Putin and Xi. Mark. Uh, thank you. I might just do those in reverse order. Um, uh, 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 David, thank you. I agree with you entirely. I wasn't, um, uh, to be clear, I'm in favour of globalisation, and indeed the G7 report said so, that the real solution to, re to economic resilience is more diversification, um, codependent relationships, etc., not um, trying to go I mean, protectionist uh, uh, and support national champions and so on. Uh, and you're absolutely right as well that... Um, China has a huge interest in globalisation. Indeed, China is one of the countries that is uh, going to be affected by uh, any interruption of grain uh, exports from uh, Russia and Ukraine. They're highly dependent uh, for maize uh, for their own livestock industry, uh, for example. And the, the interruption to food, uh, to grain exports, sorry, um, from Russia and Ukraine won't just be inflationary in the sense of the, the, the price rises we've seen with petrochemicals. Um, it, it will actually cause shortages in some places. And as, and as you know, as well as I, countries like Egypt and others highly dependent on imports are, um, uh, are, are, are at risk. So I agree with you entirely. What I was really saying was that I think there, is, there has already been a retreat from um, this sense that globalisation was this inevitable process moving forward, embedding more deeply. There have been some areas where, as, as a result of, whether it's unmanaged or whatever, um, uh, monopolies, global, global monopolies have arisen, and I mentioned critical minerals and semiconductors and, and to some extent data and digital, and these are the, the oil, steel and electricity of the, of the, modern, uh, of the modern economy. And, and so uh, we are going to need some better global economic governance in order to deal with that, and we probably should diversify away from those. Uh, so Australia, for, um, uh, for example, uh, agreeing to invest in, in some of the critical minerals is an important um, uh, element of diversifying away from being over dependent upon the production that we have from China. And by the way, that's not even a remark about China. Any monopoly, as we know, uh, can, can be abused and is, and is actually a source of fragility rather than uh, resilience. So I agree with you entirely. We should, we should be pressing ahead with globalization, but there will be some areas, I think, some sectors in which it will make more sense uh, to have. Uh, 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 a ring around allies, um, but I would think it's a minority of, of areas of the economy, uh, and that, that is probably the better um, defence against just this race to protectionism, on which I, you know, the, the consequences of which I, I, I agree could be, could be uh, deeply destabilising. Um, uh, Alan, again, I agree with you. Uh, uh, I mean, I think. All of us, professionals and politicians, um, uh, have, a, uh, have to answer some tough questions uh, about the um, hollowing out of defence capability, the reduction in, the reduction in uh, these budgets over many years. It's not just defence capability. Diplomatic service does not have the same. It's still global, but it's much more thinly spread with less um, resource uh, than it had you know, when, for example, I, uh, uh, I joined. Um, uh, uh, actually, one of the bright spots has been our development program. I mean, whether it's 0.7 or temporarily 0.5, but that's another important part of our uh, uh, global security uh, commitment. And personally, I would like to see. You're never going to. I don't think you'll ever get a, someone who's been a national security advisor sitting on a stage like this who will say they wouldn't like to see more resources, more effort, uh, 
uh, stronger uh, strategies, more commitment uh, into those areas, and I agree with you entirely. But one of the things we have to recognise as well is some of us, you know, we, you know, the system was somewhat complicit in this. As the budgets reduced, we didn't um, always reduce the size of the forces to ensure that at whatever size we were, we were still absolutely first rate. So we did allow maintenance and ordnance and training and things of that kind to be um, to be eroded, and it meant that, and that has meant that uh, forces are less flexible and less deployable than I think um, any of us uh, any of us would wish. Uh, and it seems to me that whatever budget are set by governments, we should always say, right, well, this is this is the absolutely first-rate, world-class version of the armed forces you can have for that budget. And if you want a bigger one, then you have to give us a bigger budget. Don't 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 uh, ask us to have a bigger force that isn't. Um, as effective as it uh, as it can be, and I think we sometimes slipped into that uh, in uh, in previous years. But fundamentally, I think you're right. Thank you very much. I'm going to take a, a further question that's come through uh, remotely, which is from uh, Mrs. Zinyan Zawang, and I hope I've pronounced that correctly, of Policy and Research for the <coughs> Embassy of the People's Republic of China in the United Kingdom, and she asks, what impact do you think? the Ukraine crisis will have on Sino-European relations? I think it depends fundamentally on the Chinese position. Uh, I remember on the day uh, that, that we were, uh, had the debate on this in the House of Lords, was, uh, uh, I think it was after I spoke, and David, I think it might have been just before you spoke, was the vote in the Security Council. Um, and China abstained, and that was important, because I don't think all of us were confident that China would, and that was an important distinction between their position and the Russian position. But clearly, if China provides military, um, I mean, even political, but let alone military support to Russia, then the impact on Sino-European relations would be uh, 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 very damaging. Um, uh, and, and it would be, I think, actually um, uh, sort of catastrophic for China's position in the world. If, they, if, if China aligned itself actively with this um, invasion, that will be catastrophic for China's position uh, 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 more widely in the world. And it is striking, in the General Assembly, only a handful of the usual rogue suspects voted with Russia, but there were three dozen or so in nations, including China, who abstained. Many of them countries with very close, much closer relationships with this country and others than China has, and we should be uh, putting a lot of our effort into that three dozen countries and seeking to bring uh, them on board. Uh, but as I say, I think this fundamentally depends on the Chinese position on this. Thanks very much. I'm going to take a... We've, we've got 16 minutes. Um, so I'll take Richard uh, and the gentleman in front of you. Thank you. Uh, Richard Risby, House of Lords. I chair the British Ukrainian Society. What is absolutely extraordinary is the extent of the universal, absolute detestation of Russia in this way. Now, the reason why I say this is this presents a great challenge for President Zelensky, because the atmosphere is so febrile that if you were to move to some sort of compromise or accommodation, this could present huge personal dangers for him politically. Now, if they do move to something like this, of course, it cannot include NATO membership, naturally. But the question they're all asking is, what can there be an alternative? They totally mistrust Russia and say they sign up to agreements, but they don't keep to them. So what kind of reassuring defense structure could possibly be put in place to give some sort of comfort and support to the Ukrainians whilst then not signing up to some sort of NATO future? Does such a possibility exist that you've perhaps thought about? Thank you. Thank you. And the gentleman, thanks. Thanks very much. Uh, Will James from the Changing Character War Centre in Oxford. Um, the US response so far has been quite robust uh, in terms of its uh, commitment to NATO and European security, notably in terms of troop uh, deployments. It's not quite the theatre defence that you're talking about, but it is a good example of alliance reassurance. I wonder how sustainable that is given, A, the need to pivot to the Indo-Pacific, and B, uh, US domestic politics. You mentioned about the midterms, but there is, of course, a chance that a Trump or a Trump-like figure is re-elected in 2024. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you. That's the easier of the two questions. Uh, Richard, it's really hard, I think, and I think the fact of the invasion has made it harder. You could just about see um, 
how a compromise might have been achieved before the invasion took place along the sort of lines that you have uh, set out. Um, but I don't think it's just a matter of whether President Zelensky could deliver this. He's talked about a referendum himself um, for any uh, compromise that, uh, that might be made. I think the real risk is that no guarantees, unless troops were on the ground um, and, and, and present in sufficient numbers, as Alan West was indicating um, uh, that they, uh, a few minutes ago, that they could be effective, not simply a tripwire, um, no guarantee would be, um, uh, no one would have any confidence in, in such a guarantee. Russia gave a guarantee when Ukraine gave up its nuclear weapons back in 1994. It's one of the guarantor powers of Ukraine's independence and territorial integrity. And so almost any agreement you would fear could be ripped up at the next sign of some uh, imaginary provocation and uh, a, a further Russian military, further Russian military action of some kind, even if they withdrew all their troops. So I think it is really hard to see what that, what a stable compromise could be. Now that doesn't mean I'm ruling out the prospects of a ceasefire of de-escalation, but I think we have to be really careful about assuming that that would be a stable state, uh, st a, stable, a stable state of affairs, whilst um, uh, the, the the Putin uh, government is still in power in Russia, uh, because the their ambitions, his ambitions, uh, would remain, uh, remain the same. And so maybe we end up with a frozen conflict of the kind that we've seen in effect with the um, so-called annexation of Crimea. Uh, and it may be the, uh, the, that there can be a, a ceasefire and de-escalation, but I don't think that's a peace settlement, um, uh, although that would clearly be better than the Russians continuing to grind into civilian areas and kill tens of thousands of people and, and, and push others uh, onto the move. I just think we have to be really careful about thinking that a compromise would be sustainable in these circumstances, at least in the short term. I think um, uh, the very short answer to your point is to keep the Americans in Europe, the Europeans have to do more themselves. That was always clear under Trump. I was National Security Advisor when President Trump, then President Trump, uh, visited. And the real grievance, it goes back to the point that Alan West made a few minutes ago. The real grievance in the Americans was they were investing in defense and we were investing in welfare, and that they were paying for us to do that. I mean, that's the way President Trump put it. Now, others, other Americans don't put it quite so bluntly, but that's quite a common view, that we increased all of our social protection budgets and they, increased, they maintained their defense budget and we didn't. And the way to keep the Americans engaged is to ensure that we're, we show them that we're allies worth having because we are investing in our defense and therefore forward defense of the United States and their uh, North Atlantic theater uh, as well. Thank you. Um, Anne, in in introduce yourself, sorry. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. Anne Cormack, non-executive director, Chatham House and the FCDO. Um, you talked about the retreat from globalization um, I, I'm just sitting here thinking from what has happened, or not happened actually, at the UN. Um, we've had the conversation about NATO. Do we need a different set of structures globally to be able to properly manage our way into this new world? Um, the Bretton Woods uh, type events that happened after the end of the last global conflict. Um, do we need that again? And if so, how can we achieve it? Um, who would give leadership to do it? And uh, you know, the, the next generation taking on from there, uh, what hope for them to maintain world peace? Thank you very much. Just pass the, the mic to the gentleman ahead of you, because that would be quicker. John Everard. Um, we, uh, Mark, on whose side do you think time is? Who stands to gain most if this conflict grinds on? But it seems to me that on, on the Ukrainian side, various problems emerge, that uh, the sudden shock of the invasion will fade, there will be problems of refugees, uh, doubtless will discover the occasional Ukrainian atrocity as well, and support for Ukraine will start to ebb, quite apart from the fact, of course, that Ukraine is being slowly trashed. On the Russian side, uh, the sanctions will bite, uh, Putin will probably come under ever greater domestic pressure. Over the long term, who do you think comes out best? Uh, thank you. Well, I think 
again, the short answer to the second question is no one. You know, no, one no one gains from this. The Russian campaign uh, has not achieved its objectives. It's failing at the moment, and the only way they might achieve even a reduced set of objectives is to become ever more brutal, and that will affect them as well as clearly, of course, being appalling for Ukraine. And the Russian economy is being trashed by uh, a much more effective set of sanctions than I think they might have uh, anticipated. Um, uh, 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 and you know, with all of the other consequences we've discussed. So no one wins. No one wins. Um, and the real question is, can we, goes back to the point that, that James Kidder was making, can we sustain our strategic patience and make sure that one of, the, one of the heartening features, I wouldn't say to win, but one of the heartening features of this has been the um, uh, revival of Western unity, you know, the, 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 the salutary reminder to us that we're all friends and allies and partners and uh, what... Uh, unites us is much more important than what uh, divides us. That's, that's heartening. It's not a win, but it's a heartening prospect of this, and I hope that that uh, can continue. But we've got to be clear, no one wins once an invasion of this kind um, uh, ha has, has happened. We just have to make sure we're in a better position to sustain our goals than they are, the Russians are, to sustain theirs. And then uh, that should tell in the end, because it always does. I think on your global architecture, uh, point. We thought about this, the G7 panel I chaired last year thought a bit about this, and there's a much greater expert sitting on the front row than I am uh, in Lord uh, Hannay, David Hannay. Um, and I, and I, I don't know whether you would agree, but I'm sceptical of trying to invent a whole load of new institutions. Um, and that's for a couple of reasons. One, it takes forever. Uh, there's no consensus on what is required um, uh, uh, globally to update the current set of institutions. I think second, um, if you didn't have them, you'd end up inventing something that very like them. And third, um, our position in them would probably not be as good as our position is now. We benefit from the current set of institutions uh, and the role we're able to play in them. And much more important than redesigning institutions is what use, is, what use are they put to? And can we make use of the current set of global institutions, the informal ones like the G7 uh, and G20 and so on, within the formal structures like the UN, uh, and the WTO. And we need to put more effort into that. We have not been running candidates for mid-level positions in all of these international organizations the way that some of our opponents and adversaries uh, uh, have. We haven't put enough energy into ensuring that these institutions um, see the world in a way that's aligned with our viewpoint than theirs. So I think there's a great deal more we can do to make the current set of institutions more effective and uh, advance our own interests with the same uh, confidence and energy that some of our adversaries advance theirs. Thank you very much. So as a gentleman here, I'm also going to take the, the question on the board. So first of all here. Stephen Deere, lifelong Russia watcher. Um, since the breakup of the Soviet Union, and particularly since 9-11, institutions and uh, governments in this country have taken their eye off the Russian ball. Um, now, in 2014, I remember at one of these events being approached by someone who said, there's a, an event taking place at the Foreign Office tomorrow night. We want you to come along. And there was lots of, lots of words were spoken about how wonderful it was going to be and the Foreign Office was going to ramp up its Russia coverage again. And after that, nothing. The Foreign Office had a superb set of people covering Russia and the former Soviet Union, who, partly through age, but partly through simply getting fed up with things, have retired. Now, you cannot, just as you can't replace doctors tomorrow, you can't say, oh, we're going to have 5,000 more doctors, it takes time to train them. You also can't replace Russia watchers just like that. Um, some of us who remember the Soviet Union, who lived in the Soviet Union, uh, actually have a lot of experience. Are governments, are institutions going to wake up and actually use that experience? Because one thing is for sure, after, during and after this crisis, Russia is not going to go away in a hurry. Thank you. And the second question, which dovetails nicely into, into, into that question, thank you, is from uh, Simon Bate. What is the future for Putin post-Ukraine? I'll start with the first one. Well, look, I, and I think I, I sort of made the point, I kind of agree with you, that quite a lot of our national security institutions, um, uh, diplomatic service, defence, etc., cetera, um, had their capabilities reduced over quite a long period, the peace dividend, et cetera. These were political decisions taken under successive governments of different complexions. Um, and if we were dealing with a crisis in the Middle East, 
Um, people, you know, there'd be somebody sitting there saying, we don't have as many Arabists as we used to. Um, if the crisis were in the South China Sea, they'd be saying, we don't have the Sinologists we, uh, we used to. And those things would be true as well. And the answer is you have to invest. I mean, you're absolutely right. You have to invest uh, and you have to maintain uh, capability. And uh, I think this has been a wake up call for governments, not only here, but Jack, you asked about Germany and France right at the beginning of this uh, session that uh, you, you, can't, you can't pocket the peace dividend you can't, or you can't pocket very much of it um, without making yourself vulnerable to another crisis and, uh, 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 and capability of the kind that you represent is, is part of that. By the way, I hope if there's anyone from the Foreign Office watching, they pick up the phone and, and ask whether you're available. Uh, it's, uh, I, I, got the, I got the impression you might be, and it would be good if you were. By the way, I think, I think the, we do have to say, though, you know, some things have gone pretty well in terms of institutional response. The intelligence picture of what was happening in Ukraine was remarkably strong, and that, that did arise as a result of investments we m deliberately made over a... Uh, 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 over several years, not actually particularly focused on Ukraine, but focused on Russian uh, strategic and military uh, uh, military uh, intent. Um, uh, and so I think, uh, I think there are some areas of this. Uh, we've seen fantastic material coming out of the Defence Intelligence Service, for example, synthesising everything we know on over, open as well as covert channels. So I think some areas have done well, but I think your basic point is a, is a fair one. The, the question about, well, what, what happens to Putin? I mean, I suppose the answer is who knows. Um, autocracies, um, Jock, you were talking about autocracies earlier, um, unless they have some institutional resilience, which is why I think the China example is a really interesting one, because it's the only non-monarchial -mon non um, authoritarian system that had actually built a mechanism for succession and uh, collective decision uh, making. Um, uh, I'm not by the way, saying I endorse that, but it's just striking as a, striking as a, uh, 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 as a feature. But most autocracies don't. And they, they don't have succession plans because as soon as any autocrat appoints a successor, they appoint a, they appoint a rival, and that's a dangerous thing to do. Um, I, I would sometimes ask if I was speaking at a you know, dinner engagement and we were talking about Russia, including before Ukraine, I'd say, right, hands up everyone who thinks that Vladimir, Vladimir Putin will retire at the end of his second term, write his memoirs, found a presidential library and hit the international speaker circuit. And it's a rather flippant way of making a serious point, which is no one thought that, and therefore you immediately have to ask yourself, okay, how does that end? It ends at some point. And autocracies tend to fail slowly, and then they fail very quickly. And we, we don't usually identify the moment, but when they do, we have to be ready to show real strength, because then could be, there could be even more instability in... Uh, uh, in Russian politics then than we're seeing now. And therefore, if there's instability, potential uh, aggression. Thank you very much. I'm gonna, and one last question, um, and this is from James Earl. Would it be possible for Putin to use chemical or nuclear weapons <coughs> in order to hasten the capture of cities and for NATO not to be dragged into the conflict as a consequence? <coughs> Well, that went to one of the points I made in my opening remarks about NATO's position on this. And as I said, I'm at the hawkish end of this. This is a genuine debate. I'm at the hawkish end of this. I think um, Article 5 can't just, in the modern era, can't just mean you know, territory, that almost anything up to a border is permissible and anything across that border is not permissible. It can't be as binary as that. It certainly isn't in the area of cyber. And therefore, I do think NATO needs to um, uh, uh, have the option of, of, um, uh, uh, of real deterrence. I don't want to get too much into the specifics, but of real deterrence against the use of chemical and nuclear weapons um, within uh, Ukraine. Personally, I think it would be very difficult to see how we couldn't respond were that to happen, because I just think the political outrage there would be would make it very difficult to say no this is this is still just happening within the territory of ukraine therefore the response is just more sanctions i think that's i think it's political but you know, there are politicians here who got a better sense of that than i do and therefore it would be better now to signal that um, through whatever means um, therefore hopefully to deter their use and as i said we had the doctrine of flexible response in the 80s uh, where we didn't say that any use of a tactical nuclear weapon immediately meant going to strategic nuclear weapons. There was the sense that there was a path of escalation, a very, very dangerous one. 
but therefore deterred the use of even tactical weapons because it could have escalated in that way. And I think we have to restore some sense of that flexible response and our willingness mm -hmm. to hold the line against the use of weapons of mass destruction, um, uh, notwithstanding all the obvious risks that arise from doing so. But as I say, I'm at the hawkish end of that argument. I, I do think, however, NATO leaders need to have that discussion and work out what their position is. I absolutely agree with you, and Mark, and I don't see how, the, certainly here, uh, a British government could hold public opinion uh, against our intervention through NATO if uh, the Russians were using uh, chemical weapons or still worse, nuclear weapons in the Ukraine. Um, so just before I thank Mark, I just wanted to uh, advertise the next uh, Global Strategy Forum event which is on lunchtime on Tuesday the 26th of April, uh, when Sir Malcolm Rifkin will be hosting Gideon Rackman, who many of you will know, as I know, who's Chief Foreign Affairs Correspondent of the Financial Times, who's going to be in conversation on the subject of his new book, The Age of the Strongman, How the Cult of the Leader Threaten Threatens Democracy and the World, um, uh, of which this is a precursor. Um, thank you all for attending. Thank you, uh, Jacqueline and your colleagues, uh, for organising this so brilliantly. And above all, thank you, Mark, very much for giving up, what, uh, you've got a very busy schedule, giving up your time to come here and to be very frank and open with us as you always were and draw on your incredible knowledge of diplomatic and strategic and defence matters built up over 40 years. So thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much.